Clinical Journal Club in English. And the illustration out of the New England Journal this week is a right schemes a stain of a bone marrow. And the problem concerns a 67 year old woman who's undergone a lung transplantation presents with the severe anemia and uh, makes no reticulocytes. And we're offered chronic lung allograft dysfunction, possible, I suppose, but shouldn't result in no reticulocytes. Acute promyelocytic leukemia, I think that's unlikely because these are not myeloid precursor cells that we see in the smear. Uh, adverse reaction to an immunosuppressant, I guess is always possible. Uh, hepatitis B, virus infection is not a bone marrow disease, and that leaves us with parvovirus B19. And if you're involved in organ transplantation uh, or with immunosuppressed patients in general, you're aware of the fact that parvovirus, which most of us have within us, can be reactivated and it causes severe anemia and uh, markedly decreased reticulocytosis because the erythroid precursors are inhibited from pro proliferating the way that they should. And that indeed is the um, uh, correct answer. And next week we'll get more details. I'll remind you of the fact that there are five viral exanthems that uh, aff affect mostly children, measles, mumps, chicken pox, rubella, and erythema infectiosum. Uh, this is also called by clinician, clinicians a slapped face appearance. This young child looks like he's been slapped on the right side and on the left side. He has these rosy red cheeks. Now, these children may get a transient anemia, but it's usually trivial. Uh, but in utero, this virus can cause some substantial problems. And as you see here, as we continue to age, most of us are seropositive for this virus. So in this patient, this was a, a reactivation of a viral infection that she'd probably had within childhood. And uh, proerythroblasts are involved here, resulting in, can result in severe anemia and uh, a reticulocyte count of zero. And the treatment is uh, withdrawing immunosuppression if that's possible. The first topic in the New England Journal has to do with um, proton pump inhibition. And patients that are intensive care units are routinely given proton pump inhibitors in the idea that this inhibits gastrointestinal bleeding, which can be a devastating complication in patients in intensive care units. So this is given as a prophylactic measure and all patients get, get this. Now there are a number of preparations that can be applied here. Pantoprazole is only one of them. It consists of a racemic mixture and it blocks one of the subunits of this proton pump that's present in parietal cells, very effectively incidentally. So in this large intensive care unit study uh, conducted in Europe, uh, ICU patients with a whole variety of diagnoses here, chronic lung disease, myocardial infarction, heart failure, immunosuppression, cancers of various sorts, AIDS, coagulopathy, et cetera, were randomized to receive uh, proton pump inhibition or placebo. The primary outcome was death after, uh, within 90 days of randomization. And what happened was uh, indeed episodes of important gastrointestinal bleeding were reduced compared to placebo, uh, but the reduction is 1.7 percent, indicating that gastrointestinal bleeding in patients that are in intensive care units with a variety of problems is not very common. And in the placebo group afflicted only 4.2 percent of the patients and uh, this um, prevalence was reduced to 2.5% with uh, proton pump inhibition. In survival, there was absolutely no difference. And in these various subgroups that you see in this forest plot, there were also no difference uh, in placebo against uh, pantoprazole. 
indicating that perhaps proton pump inhibition is not necessarily mandatory in patients in intensive care units. And we can debate this if you like. Uh, one group would say, well, it reduced uh, uh, important gastrointestinal bleeding by a relative difference of perhaps 35%, but the absolute difference is 1.7%, which makes the number needed to treat of uh, greater than 50. So perhaps patients where you know they're only going to be there for a few days after um, cardiac catheterization or something like that, that are not going to be there for extended periods of time or that have no prior history of gastrointestinal problems, perhaps this prophylactic measure uh, could be abandoned. The next topic has to do with mucus. And you'll recall that um, in ancient medicine, there were four humors, uh, blood, slime, yellow bile, and black bile. And here we're talking about slime, which involves mucous membranes. So we're concerned here with mucus production. And there are numerous genes that encode for uh, mucus-like substances that we excrete through our little goblet cells here in the respiratory tract and elsewhere in what we generously call mucous membranes. And we're talking here about mucin 5B, MUC5B, that encodes for one of these mucus proteins. And a variant and mucus 5, uh, MUC5B has been associated with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. That is known. Now, the study here involves patients with rheumatoid arthritis. And about half the patients with rheumatoid arthritis get a mysterious, unknown interstitial lung disease. They can also get rheumatoid nodules called Kaplan syndrome. That generally happens only in patients with rheumatoid arthritis that are exposed to coal dust. But about half the patients with rheumatoid arthritis get interstitial lung disease. And this can be detected by CT and uh, pulmonary or clinical pulmonary function tests. So these patients show up with unknown interstitial pneumonia or UIP. And what was done in this study is that a large population of patients with rheumatoid arthritis from various countries underwent CT to see if they had interstitial lung disease. And then all the patients in this study were genotyped for this promoter variant, and this SNP is listed here, RS, and then this big long number, which is a promoter variant in MUC5B. And actually, this promoter variant is a gain of function promoter variant. So people that have this variant make more phlegm than people that don't have this variant. And perhaps this somehow contributes to, pulmon uh, to interstitial fibrotic lung disease, although exactly how that might work is not known. So these people were all genotyped uh, for this MUC5B variant. And then some of the patients where this was possible, uh, if they underwent lung transplantation, uh, Lung tissue was um, <coughs> acquired from these patients. Their genotypes were known and their uh, mucus production or expression of MUC5B was measured. And what we see here is um, uh, patients without rheumatoid arthritis, without interstitial lung disease, had an odds ratio of having this variant of one. That means that the line is straight up and down and no increased risk. In Japanese subjects, it looks like this was moved to the right a bit, but the variance is so great that this was not statistically significant. But in patients that had interstitial lung disease, we see the odds ratio that had that they would have this promoter variant was markedly increased about sixfold. And then we can compare patients with interstitial lung disease to those that didn't have it or the ones that had this unknown interstitial pneumonia. And we also see an a, a positive association with those conditions there. So if we look at this table here, uh, uh, we can uh, look at this dominant genetic association of MUC5B promoter variants uh, with interstitial lung disease. And the patients are, for the most part, heterozygous for uh, this condition. And indeed, if we look at the staining in uh, 
lung disease where patients didn't have this promoter variant, we don't see increased expression, but in patients that had the uh, promoter variant, we see increased expression of this material. Now, I had to go into the literature a little bit to try to figure out how this promoter works and promoter bashing has been done here. And so we, if we look at this luciferase reporter assay and people that are in specimens that are homozygous for this promoter variant, we see more than twice the expression of wild type. And uh, there is a correlation that looks at uh, mucin 5B positive areas of bronchial bronchiolar epithelium uh, with this promoter variant, and you can see that result here. So it appears that this mucin 5B promoter variant that's been associated with interstitial lung disease could play a very important role in patients with rheumatoid arthritis that develop interstitial lung disease and perhaps uh, this fairly simple uh, genetic diagnostic test could select out those patients that are at risk for developing interstitial lung disease. So the next topic is small cell lung cancer. And you'll recall that lung cancer is a very important topic and three quarters of the lung cancers are non-small cell lung cancers, either squamous cell carcinoma or adenocarcinoma. And then there are small cell lung cancers in about 20% of the subjects. And these cancers that are also associated with smoking come from so-called APUD cells. Those are amine precursor uptake and decarboxylation. In other words, these are cells that are endocrine active, so you can almost classify this tumor as a neuroendocrine tumor. Uh, that's a little bit misspoken, but that's what APID cells represent. And the hypothesis that was tested here is whether or not we could use checkpoint inhibition uh, by blocking PD-1 signaling pathway uh, to, uh, as a chemotherapy for these patients with small cell lung cancer. We've already seen studies where in patients with non-small cell lung cancer, this checkpoint inhibition appeared to help these patients. And indeed, checkpoint inhibition did improve overall survival in patients with small cell lung cancer and progression-free survival. Uh, these healing powers were not dramatic in the forest plot, it looks like individual subgroups, whether they had metastases, if they had brain metastases, that they were not well off. But um, it looked like the patients that um, were older seemed to benefit particularly. But these things are there are not enough subjects in this study to make much uh, draw much conclusions from this forest plot. But what we see here is that objective confirmed response, complete response as, as judged by the physicians, et cetera. The patients that got this checkpoint inhibition seem to profit from this chemotherapy. But if we look at this in detail, we can see that the treated group had a survival expectancy that was two months longer uh, than the placebo group. And then we have to decide, okay, uh, can we afford this relatively expensive treatment to offer these patients an extra 60 days of lifespan? And I guess healthcare systems will have to deal with that question. The, the next uh, uh, subject in the New England Journal involves lactation. And you'll recall that pregnant women after delivery, they release a hormone from the pituitary called prolactin. Prolactin interacts with a prolactin receptor on breast tissue to result in milk production and milk letdown. And that's how that's supposed to work. And pretty much everybody knows that. Now in this patient, a 35 year old woman, she didn't make any milk. She had children okay. Pregnancy seemed to run okay. And I believe as our, she had four deliveries, but um, uh, she, uh, there was no milk let down. And what was found here is she's a compound heterozygote for loss of function of the prolactin receptor. So in German, we call this gemischt heterozygote, compound heterozygote. She received one mutation from mother, one mutation from father, and end up being a compound heterozygote. So she has a loss of function variant in the gene encoding the prolactin receptor.
This has been reported in earlier studies. And um, the proband and her two sisters were heterozygous for missense, uh, uh, for missense variants. Uh, and um, the proband received dopamine agonist therapy to terminate persistent galactorrhea after all four of her deliveries. Uh, she and a sister were oligomenorrheic, and the other sister was infertile. So if we look at these data here, uh, here's the patient and uh, no staining in this Western blot. And uh, we can look at immunohistochemistry here, uh, no receptor. And uh, when receptor function was looked at, uh, then uh, the mutation resulted in a non-functional uh, protein, which I think in one of these diagrams, we can see this is the patient and this is a truncated protein that didn't work properly. So the results of this study involve a woman who was compound heterozygote for loss of function mutations in the prolactin receptor. She had agalactia associated with hyperprolactinemia. Prolactin levels were high. And uh, this result would suggest that only lactation and not other biologic functions are dependent on, on the prolactin receptor. The first review in the New England Journal, and here's another uh, German, we call this Schlagwort. This is a euphemism uh, or a cliche word. And uh, we're talking about the connectome. You've heard of the genome, the proteome, the microbiome, the metabolome, and now we have the connectome. Uh, this term refers to connections between brain areas, how brain areas communicate uh, so that the brain can function as a functional unit. And uh, whether or not this works properly can be observed in patients that have specific brain lesions, uh, strokes and tumors or trauma and this sort of thing. And with functional magnetic resonance, these connectome areas can be mapped. And this is important, particularly in patients that are to be treated with device therapy, where certain areas of the brain are to be stimulated with stimulators or um, in certain patients that have, for instance, Parkinson's disease uh, or seizure disorders that are refractory or things of this nature. I'm not an expert in this. There's a lot of MRI discussion here, uh, but uh, this review is on the connectome. And if you're into, interested in this kind of research, then this would be a good review in order to get tuned up on that kind of topic. So there are lots of ideas about clinical applications for this. Uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation is a tool that's used for patients with refractory depression, uh, might have some role in treating patients with Huntington's disease and other things. So this is an important area of uh, uh, neuroscience research. The next review in the New England Journal is also terribly important. It's about bacterial vaginosis and vaginitis. Now these diseases are indeed diseases of the microbiome. And you'll recall that we have microbiomes wherever we have a mucous membrane. So the whole gastrointestinal tract, or particularly the lower gastrointestinal tract, is filled with trillions of bacteria that we term a microbiome, but also uh, the nose, um, sinuses to a degree, the respiratory tract up to a certain level, uh, vaginal epithelium, the urethra, et cetera, each has its own microbiome. And the microbiome and vaginosis is disturbed and uh, this results in uh, a, a cellular differentiation that you can see if you make a simple smear or a gram stain of uh, uh, vaginal secretions. There's also particular odors with these conditions that are helpful. And actually the diagnosis here does not require the polymerase chain reaction. This can be established with simply measuring the pH of the vaginal fluid with a pH strip or something of this nature, uh, and um, simple clinical tools to determine the presence of vaginosis or vaginitis.
And these latter conditions are particularly important in pregnancy because they result in premature labor and delivery. As a matter of fact, we looked at a Lancet paper some weeks ago, testing the hypothesis that treating vaginosis might impair the development of preterm delivery. The study was unfortunately negative, but preterm delivery is markedly associated with changes in the vaginal microbiome. And uh, we can look at, these are normal vaginal epithelial cells, and this is a normal looking cervix, and this is a cervix and vaginosis, and this is a cervix and vaginitis, and with a little bit of clinical training, just looking under the microscope at 40X uh, magnification, we can identify these cells, and measuring pH, we can establish a diagnosis. And there are, uh, the pathogenesis uh, is fairly well worked out. Um, it's important to recognize that uh, uh, these things are also associated with HIV positivity, and uh, the presence of vaginosis increases the infectiousness of HIV in, in women that are HIV positive, and this is an important disease burden that results in premature childbirth and uh, abortion, premature abortion and pelvic inflammatory disease and these kinds of conditions. Now, vaginosis can be treated, and probably the treatment of choice is metronidazole uh, instead of clindamycin. Uh, and in the study that we looked at in the Lancet, the clinicians used clindamycin, perhaps metronidazole would have been better. And uh, that's the point uh, of this particular review, uh, which I would encourage you to gain familiarity with this topic. Uh, the vaginitis is a little more complicated to treat, but it's also a diagnosis that's made clinically. Uh, vaginosis is commonly asymptomatic or doesn't result in pain or itching or things of this nature, and vaginitis is more likely to be symptomatic. So uh, vaginitis is treated differently than vaginosis, and um, uh, glucocorticoid creams and things of this nature may play, play, play some role, uh, but clindamycin and uh, fluconazole and treatments of this nature seem to be more prevalent here, useful here, uh, as compared to metronidazole. Then this patient in the New England Journal has this uh, lesion that you can see in the, uh, in the liver uh, on CT, and we can tell easily that this um, the density of this lesion is a, a liquid density. It's not air as seen here. So we can express this as Hounsfield units. Mm -hmm. And uh, these things have to be diagnosed because it might be a hepatic abscess. And the fluid drained from this abscess had this uh, reddish color. And that's suggestive of an amoebic abscess, an amoebic abscess. And indeed, uh, looking at this material in a wet mount, uh, we can see the amoebae. Uh, but uh, the patient was also antibody positive for an amoeba histolytica, was treated appropriately, and then did better. So you have to be aware of amoebic ab abscesses because they still occur. The patient in the New England Journal is a 74-year-old man who presents with jaundice. And uh, his wife had noticed this. And this patient is, has numerous chronic illnesses and uh, uh, these are known. He has hypertension, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, and gout, takes numerous medications. He has a history of having undergone a laparoscopic cholecystectomy for cholecystitis, and uh, the procedure resulted in uh, substantial complications. So you had to have a second operation where a hepaticojejunostomy was uh, performed so that he would have adequate drainage of bile contents. Of course, he's not left with a normal functioning sphincter or anything of this nature, and we might imagine that this would subsequently cause problems. So the patient comes in with a temperature of 38 degrees, he's a little, has a heart rate a little faster than we would expect, uh, his blood pressure is okay, uh, he's a little jaundiced, he's got 11,800 white cells, so he has a leukocytosis has a hemoglobin of 11, so that's reduced. Platelet count is okay. So this doesn't look like cirrhosis or chronic liver disease. 
but we do observe that she, he has an elevated alanine aminotransferase and his aspartate aminotransferase is also elevated and his alkaline phosphatase is definitely not normal. And so we would imagine that perhaps something with this biliary tree isn't working properly. Uh, coagulation parameters were not disturbed. So he gets an ultrasound examination. He steadily gets worse and his white count increases to 32,000, his uh, uh, mostly neutrophils and 8% bands. And I found a, a, this peripheral smear was not given from this patient, but this is what it looked like. These are banned granulocytes or neutrophils, and they contain these bluish inclusion bodies seen on right Gimza stain. And these are called Döhle bodies. And Döhle bodies indicate abnormal ripening of granulocytes and Dula bodies consist of uh, rough endoplasmic reticulum uh, that has not been properly metabolized. And the presence of Dula bodies are associated with a numerous severe acute illnesses, including scarlet fever and typhus and sepsis of any cause. They're also typical in may Heglin anomaly, but I'm not going to go into that here. Uh, so the clinicians finally recognized that he had sepsis. They got some blood sample, uh, drew some blood on him and found out that the blood was hemolyzed. And uh, hemolyzed blood is usually due to technical errors by the people drawing the blood sample, but can also be due to other things. Now here's a CT that shows a collection of free air within the liver and also other areas of free air, which would caused me major headaches as a clinician. So what we see here is a, sepsi, a septic picture with free air. And we used to call this gas gangrene. And it's lethal. And it's caused by clostridium perfringens that also results in hemolysis of blood in vivo, not in vitro. And so here, I don't know what sort of blood drawing sets they use in Boston, but uh, uh, so I don't, I quite can't identify with these tubes, but this second sample, we can see that the supernatant that should be a clear serum is, uh, demonstrates hemolysis. And so as blood cultures, to no surprise to me, drew clostridium perfringens, which exists in our gastrointestinal tract at low levels and hardly ever causes any problem. Uh, the people that get gas gangrene from trauma, such as in the First World War, for instance, uh, got their clostridia from the soil. Clostridia are gram-positive spore-forming bacteria. This can re be recognized in gram staining fairly readily. Uh, and they pr produce, a, clostridia produce a variety of toxins and gas and clostridium perfringens causes gas gangrene, and that explains the syndrome. I would think that this poor patient probably died because gas gangrene is lethal. The next topic in the New England Journal involves mentoring. Now, those of you that have had a classical education will recall who mentor was. And if you ever read the Odyssey, the Odyssey has to do with Odysseus and his adventures as he traveled around the Mediterranean for 20 years. He left his young wife and newborn child at home, and his son was called Telemachus. And somebody had to raise his son. His wife did the best she could, but his son had a very good teacher who was also a role model. And this teacher's name was Mentor. And from Mentor, we get the term mentoring. So mentoring is more than just a teacher and a friend. A mentor also has to be a role model. And mentoring has gotten to be a cliche. And if you look into Google, you will learn how to mentor. And there's a lot of propaganda about mentoring. But the, role, the idea that the mentor has to be a role model uh, is hardly emphasized in any of this literature that I ran into.
Now in the New England Journal, there's a, a paper written by six women and it's about mentoring of women in academic medicine. And they draw attention to the fact that since we have the hashtag Me Too era, uh, that mentoring has decreased markedly uh, in US academic medicine because apparently the men are afraid to talk to the women in case they might be accused of behaving like Harvey Weinstein. But I think that the whole paper is kind of ridiculous because it misses the point. Harvey Weinstein was not a role model. Uh, he was a Grabscha, as we say in German, and Grabscha are not role models. So these authors uh, give several scenarios. For instance, here's Jim. Uh, he leads a clinical division, probably cardiology, I imagine. And he's hired two excellent young female clinician researchers. And usually he invites new faculty member out for a few beers or to play squash. And now he's terribly confused and he's afraid to ask these women to go out and have a few beers. And so the authors suggest reach out to trusted women leaders to discuss your fears. I'll have to remember that. And then the second scenario, fear is a social construct. And here it's about Spencer. He's a new physician in chief at this hospital running a department of internal medicine, probably or surgery or something. And um, he happens to hear about a female colleague who has been passed over for promotion. And uh, instead of writing two nature papers, she had two young children during this time. And so she's passed over for promotion. And uh, was this sexist gender bias? Possibly. And so the authors recommend to Spencer, if you're worried about being perceived as sexist, address the fear head on. That's always a good idea. And in the third case, David runs a cardiology department. Same kind of problem. And I think that the point here is that the mentors have to be role models, not just teachers and uh, superiors. They also have to be a role model. And uh, that's a little different uh, than uh, what is usually d discussed under mentoring, uh, because um, uh, role models are responsible for promoting scholarship and their scholarship can take numerous forms. And um, He's going to have to deal with also his male and female employees, and I hope he's a role model for both. What sort of scholarship is expected here and what can I do to meet expectations so that I can get promoted on time? So I present everything that's in these journals. So that's one of the things that appeared in the New England Journal. Uh, now we move to the Lancet. And the first topic is ankylosing spondylitis. And uh, you're aware this is an autoimmune disease and it's uh, characterized by the patients are mostly HLA B27 positive and it involves the spinal cord and sacroiliac joint. It results in major deformities and it's a major clinical problem. Uh, because up until relatively recently, we had little chance to alter the course of this disease, although we could relieve symptoms somewhat. And the target here involves interleukin-17. And interleukin-17 is a major pro-inflammatory cytokine uh, that results in uh, inflammation and uh, the, has an influence on the distribution of T cells and uh, how they behave and interaction with under, other interleukins and uh, other features that um, uh, you can find better experts than me to discuss. But at any rate, it's about an antibody directed against interleukin 17A, which is in a component of the interleukin 17 complex in patients that are already receiving other treatments, anti TNF alpha and other things, uh, for their ankylosing spondylitis. And there are numerous assessments that are done in these patients. And what we see here is that um, uh, the antibody groups um, uh, beat placebo and look about the same, uh, but it looks like um, uh, blocking IL-17 uh, looks like a reasonable clinical maneuver uh, 
uh, in these uh, patients. Uh, adalimumab represents the active reference group, uh, but the new antibody may offer some advantages compared to the old antibody. Uh, and so that's the added value of this study. So that looks pretty promising. Now, the next topic is really pretty difficult uh, for me because it involves um, bullying, which I guess is a psychiatric diagnosis. And um, bullying is a major problem. Uh, it's been around since human beings have been on the planet. And what was done in this study is a uh, um, Strategies were developed in schools to try to decrease the amount of bullying in children that were in the ninth grade, so about 13, 14 years old. And when an individual um, uh, bullies a, another individual, that's called bullying. If it's a group activity, we in English, that's called mobbing. Uh, but what was done is that um, in these schools, the schools were randomized to a strategy to try to make children aware of bullying and to get at least the ones that are bullies to stop. And uh, these behaviors can be measured. It reminded me about this guy that we had in Germany some years back. Uh, he was the world's biggest bully and he was amazingly successful, he, although he was a small man and he, he couldn't have touched anybody physically because he would have knocked, been knocked down. And he was a successful bully of even major statesmen like Neville Chamberlain and Daladier. And, uh, and how did he do it? Uh, well, he was successful mostly in bullying men. He tried to bully one woman. Her name was Dorothy Thompson. And she wrote about him. He is formless, almost faceless, a man whose countenance is a caricature. He is inconsequent ill-poised and insecure. So that's a pretty good description of bullies. Uh, he's the very prototype of a little man. So she wrote that, and since she was an American, she couldn't be put in a concentration camp, but she was thrown out of the country immediately. So here are the children in these uh, British schools that were randomized, and they have a various uh, heterogeneous backgrounds as they're seen in English schools. And then I found in the supplement how this strategy works. And then it, it requires coaches or facilitators and staff training. This is a lot of work uh, trying to intervene on these children to explain to them the nature of bullying, why this is a cowardly be behavior uh, characterized, uh, conducted mostly by insecure people and how to avoid it. And what the authors found after 36 months of this study was they found a minimal effect. But at any rate, they found an effect, but it was not great, which indicates that the strategies that are developed for bullying are going to have to be improved. Then in India, there was also a study on bullying. The children are about the same age, and what was done here is strategies that were conducted by teachers were compared to lay people that had been counseled in how to convey this message to children. And that was done. And uh, you can read the details here uh, in these Indian schools where this is also a problem. And what was found here was the lay instructors that were not the teachers were more effective in conveying this message than the teachers. Maybe that indicates that they have a problem with their teachers, but that was the result. Now the review in Lancet is on climate change and climate change seems to be getting worse. And there are a whole variety of recommendations that uh, include um, um, coal fired plants and all sorts of things that could be done to decrease CO2 production uh, and um, uh, the various effects of climate change with which you are aware and the medical, uh, the medical consequences uh, decreased agricultural productivity, undernutrition, cardiovascular disease, respiratory disease, harmful algal blooms, and these various things are all discussed here. Are things getting worse? Uh, yes, because uh, summer warming seems to be increasing. If we wait this for the increase in population, which isn't 
really touched upon in this review, uh, this increase is even more profound. And um, that's what's going on in Katowice as we speak. And so the relative change here has gotten dramatically worse in 2008 compared to 2016, uh, irrespective of what Donald Trump thinks about it. And you can look at all the areas of the world that are gonna be more, uh, for the most part, affected with the uh, de deleterious effects of climate change, but also the proliferation of mosquitoes. Uh, they don't mind warm water, uh, warm weather, as long as there's enough water and uh, the countries that are afflicted uh, and that contribute to this process are listed here. And there's even a countdown on what could be done here. So I'm almost done, but there were four science papers that I wanted to draw to your attention because they have to do with food, uh, which also has something to do with the environment. I suppose this is a healthy sandwich. Uh, and uh, bicycles are also healthy. Uh, I like these disc brakes. Those are a good idea. I don't know what all these vegetables are doing here, I, but at any rate, that's what it's about. Uh, the first paper is on fat, and we were always taught that fat is bad for you, and low fat developed into a mantra in the United States, low fat foods. So instead, they fed the people a lot of foods without any fat, but with lots of simple carbohydrates and health got worse. And so this is a whole discussion of the fat issue and what kind of fats might be good for you, or perhaps we should eat fats and eat no carbohydrates and that would be a ketogenic diet and that might have advantages for certain conditions. So these are the current controversies and it's surprising that after all this research, we still don't know very much about this. Um, should we eat fats, yes or no? Uh, should our ketogenic diets a good idea? And if we eat fats, what kind of fats should they be? And what are the effects on LDL cholesterol, HDL cholesterol triglycerides? So that's the discussion here. So pretty much what's agreed upon is that uh, polyunsaturated fats seem to be a good idea, uh, res resulted, uh, resulting in an improvement in all-cause mortality, are better than monounsaturated fats, Saturated fats are not so good, and trans fats are against the law in New York City, for instance. Then the second paper is about fasting uh, and caloric restriction in general. In German, we would say, frist die Hälfte, eat half as much, great idea. If you do that to monkeys and mice and rats, they live longer. Or there are other forms of fasting, periodic fasting, for instance, feed the mice every other day, that also results in increase in survival. And then there are other fasting mimicking strategies, interval fasting, and, and all of this is discussed in this review and the biochemistry of the effects of these strategies are worked out in considerable detail. I'm just touching on some of the figures, but if you're interested in this topic, I'll be happy to send you the PDFs of this paper, of these papers. So energy consumption and how this works on individual parts of the body are shown here. Then of course, gut microbiota. Couldn't have a, a review of the topic without that. And what do our bacteria want? And what do they ferment? And uh, what do they produce? And how is this helpful? And um, which bacteria should we be having? We've heard about the great lactobacilli compared to the bad Godzilla bacters and whatever else lives in there. And then of course, in Paleolithic times, everything was better. People ate these healthy foods. Of course, they died at age 23, but that isn't generally discussed by the authors. Uh, vegetarians are better people for various reasons, at least they think so. Mediterranean diets and microbiota targeted diets, and you can read about all that here. So the last one is on athletic performance and diet, and that's important for those of you that are performing athletes. So what's on the menu and uh, how, how should, should we carbohydrate load before the marathon or should we be uh, eating something else and uh, what's legal and what's not and what's the biochemistry of all this this is also discussed in these reviews.
Uh, and what about these performance drinks, Red Bull, and the, uh, do these things really work? And um, worth knowing something about that. And where are the control trials? And where are they? Just no data, and it all rests on opinion. I'm almost done. Uh, the last case involves dermoid cysts compared to epidermoid cysts. And the term dermoid cyst actually refers to teratomas and dermoid cysts, for instance, this, this one's full with a bunch of teeth. Good thing that these are mostly benign and grow very slowly. And epidermoid cysts come from epidermis and they can be throughout the body, including the central nervous system. And our patient is this 80 year old man I'm told he has a four day history of a throbbing headache, not relieved by analgesics. Now brain tumors hardly ever cause headache. If you have a headache, you don't have a brain tumor. This patient was an exception and he's got this big brain tumor and here it is. And I could think it causes headache because he's got a shift uh, to the right side of the midline. And if we look at this, uh, this thing is eating into his calvarium. And I would think maybe a neurosurgeon should take this out. But these neurosurgeons decided to differentiate this. Is this a dermoid cyst or is it an epidermoid cyst? Because if it's a dermoid cyst, you probably ought to take it out. But if it's an epidermoid cyst, you can ask him if he could please just get used to having a throbbing headache. And that's the discussion here. And what we see here is with this additional uh, MRI weighting, we can distinguish dermoid cyst from epidermoid cyst, and this patient had an epidermoid cyst. Now, the Monroe-Kelly doctrine has to do with how much space is left in your calvarium. The neurosurgeons apparently weren't crazy about operating on this poor patient, but uh, if this, I would think the biggest risk here isn't a headache. I think he's probably going to have a seizure, and if he does, he'll probably have a bunch of fractures, and perhaps they should have taken this out but evidently they didn't. So that's for this week. Join me next week for another smashing clinical journal club and we'll see what they're up to then. Thank you for your attendance. Ja, natürlich.